Okay, this is part two to Philippi 2 um, on the ideas in the C.S. Lewis videos. Um, um, Philippi, I wanted to first, I may have to do two videos. I, I wanted to go uh, into the um, syllogism more deeply. I, I'm not satisfied with the job I did explaining it. Um, so I'm going to launch into this syllogistic thing. I think it's very interesting. And there were some comments from a subscriber named Corkrix, which are fascinating. And um, uh, so, he, so here we go. Um, in logic, we have a, 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 a valid form of, of logical conclusion called the modus tollens lens and this basically says if you have the statement uh, if P then Q P is the antecedent Q is the consequent if P then Q and you can deny the consequent you can you can prove not Q then you could validly conclude not P uh, why does that work well if it's true that P implies Q and you can prove not Q we don't have Q then we cannot have P because if we have P we would have Q but we do not have Q uh, therefore we don't have P so it's the circle of contradiction and that's considered a valid argument to disprove Q I mean to disprove P the antecedent on the basis of deny, denying Q the, the consequent now the logical fallacy associated with this is called the fallacy of of denying the antecedent where you deny P and conclude not Q when really what should be happening validly is to deny Q and conclude not P uh, so you have the statement uh, P implies Q uh, then you say but not P and then you say well because not P then not Q and this does not follow uh, because uh, the fact that, that P being true implies that Q being true does not mean that if P is false Q is not true Q could still be true there may be another way to reach Q um, uh, so, so it's it's a fallacy. Um, denying P does not imply uh, a not Q. Now, let's look at the uh, let's look at the syllogism in, in C.S. Lewis. Uh, co it's commonly stated as um, Jesus was a liar or a either. Uh, well, here here's the or string of or it's a string of or statements. Jesus was a liar or Jesus was a lunatic or Jesus was the Lord now as three as a statement of, of three uh, basically a string of or statements it's just a statement um, you know and any one of those statements being true any one of those three pieces being true renders the whole statement true but what what people do is they put it into a, a different grammatical form they say either uh, Jesus was a liar or a lunatic or he was the Lord and what that is is a hidden implication and the the implication that is is hidden in there is this uh, if Jesus is a liar or a lunatic then he is not the Lord okay so you have a kind of a P implies not Q um, then the next step in the logic is they say and uh, Jesus is not a liar or a lunatic now notice this is a denial of the antecedent to the I mean the yeah, the antecedent, the antecedent, antecedent is that he's either a liar or a lunatic, and we're saying he's not a liar or a lunatic. And the conclusion is then uh, to deny, deny the consequent to say that he is not not the Lord, which means therefore he is the Lord. The two knots cancel each other out. So, in other words, you're saying uh, if uh, Jesus is a liar or a lunatic, then he is not the Lord. But he is not a liar or a lunatic, therefore he is not not the Lord, therefore he is the Lord. And that's the logical fallacy. So syllogistically, um, this is the fallacy of denying the antecedent um, and, and then concluding a denial of the consequent. Um, so it is a logical fallacy. It doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> However, I had pointed out, I had said, made the statement that, uh, you know, but but viewed sort of from a set theory point of view or as a string of diminishing uh, uh, choices, it has persuasive force. Uh, Corkrix uh, mentioned, and he had some excellent points, you know, that, okay, this argument has emotive force for someone who already wishes to believe, you know, and that's true. And then also the uh, the emotive force emotive force is increased by the alliteration of the sentence it gives it an emotional appeal and the emotive force you know uh, liar lunatic lord um, has a poetic appeal to us you know um, and and this this is very very clever uh, very clever and I agree with him completely um, but w what I'm saying is let's look at this through the eyes of a, of a, of a workers comp claims adjuster in in the real world right uh, not not as a logical problem but as a problem of reason a practical problem of reason uh, someone steps forward a human being steps forward and they say I got injured at work okay now for every claims adjuster there are basically four possibilities one 
they're telling the truth. They got injured at work. Two, they're lying. It's a fraudulent claim. They were not injured at work. Three, there is a psychological component to the case. Um, they might be delusional, um, or they may simply believe that they are more injured than not. They have a psychological overlay, or four, some combination of the above part of part of it is true, part of it's a lie, part of it is a psychological problem, and then you go about invest and you know the combination. So you go about investigating all of these things, and the law actually forces you to make a choice. You don't, you, you can't just not choose. You know, you investigate. You know, were they at work? Uh, yes or no. Well, was there an accident? Yes or no. Um, what's the medical evidence say? Uh, is the medical evidence consistent with an injury having occurred? Is a person there for you? This all goes to the credibility of people uh, and to the claimant. Um, uh, yes. No, uh, is the medical consistent, but the, the injury shouldn't have been this bad. Okay, is there a psychological overlay? Get some psychiatric evidence to explore that. Um, uh, now, it could also be that there's an error. This is a fourth possibility that they have a, this happens often in the case of occupational disease. They have an, a disease they believe is caused by job, the job, maybe uh, a lung cancer, but it turns out it actually has a different cause. So they're not you know they're they're telling the truth that they honestly believe that they were injured at work it turns out it's simply an error that the disease actually originates somewhere else maybe it occurred to them or maybe they had an epileptic epileptic seizure at work but that doesn't mean work caused the epileptic seizure but they believe it does so there you go um uh so following this sort of process of reason, which is maybe the oblique approach that, that was talked of in the video, not a, uh, not going by the force of a pure logical argument, but by this approach of reason, practical reason and evidence, um, maybe that's the oblique approach talked about in the video. Uh, anyway, it's perfectly reasonable to go by this uh, to conclude, uh, to, con to become a Christian, I think. You know, that's perfectly reasonable to do uh, if you weigh all the evidence, and, and people do. They read the scriptures, and in fact, in the video, it mentions that he, he decided that the that much of the, the, I suppose he's talking about the Gospels, much of the Bible really does appear to be an eyewitness account. Now, this rings true to him. To other people, it won't ring true. Every claims adjuster will come up, uh, you know, there's variance between the decisions. Uh, you know, everybody has to weigh the evidence for themselves. Now, there are some hidden assumptions. What are the hidden assumptions in, the, in this, um, uh, this choice? Uh, one hidden assumption is that, well, first, that Jesus existed, and many people dispute that. Uh, many people don't. Many people believe he do. They do the evidence. They look for historical evidence to support yes or no. Um, another one is, um, oh, what's another hidden assumption? Okay, uh, one, that Jesus existed. Two, that Jesus made a claim to divinity, because this is all, we're talking about assessing claims. Um, some people dispute this. I mean, I've heard various Muslim scholars uh, claim that uh, nowhere in the scriptures does uh, Jesus make a claim to divinity. So was a claim ever made in the first place? Um, um, and each person has to decide for themselves. But this is a, a reasonable process, and it appears to me that this is the process they're describing uh, C.S. Lewis having gone through. Uh, did, did the events that are described in the, in the scriptures really occur? You know? Um, um, so that is sort of where that comes from. It's very, it's very, very interesting. So, as I, this is why I drew a quick distinction in my last video about the difference between logic and reason. You know, uh, uh, logic forces you to include to a conclusion. Reason sort of leads you to a conclusion, but it often gets based on probabilities. How probable is it that someone is telling the truth? How probable is it that? the doctor is correct. How probable is it that, you know, um, and so you are making a decision. Uh, now, it's a decision, a decision to believe. So, um, if you're predisposed to believe, I mean, sometimes I think that the difference between being uh, atheist and uh, being a believer, being a non-believer, a believer, uh, sometimes I think that comes down to a matter of temperament, you know, and also a matter of standards of proof. If you have really high standards of, of proof, ec extremely high standards, um, you may not basically conclude yourself into belief. Um, that's the story. I'm running out of time. I'm going to do another video for you on some of the other ideas the, uh, to ex expand a bit on the idea of um, joy as a desire. Um, because the next step in the logic or the reasoning of the video is that to every, the assumption, uh, uh, to every 
uh, intense innate desire there must correspond an existing object um, but that's for another video I'll talk to you later Philippi 2 thanks a lot bye bye